Well, why don't we stand together, and we're going to read from Colossians, the third chapter. You can read it off of the PowerPoint, or open up a Bible in front of you, which they're all the new King James, and we'll go along with uh, the PowerPoint. Colossians 3, verses 12 to 15, says this, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Father, thank you for all you've done in our life, for all the things you've done that we're not even aware of. The times you've protected us, you've protected our family, you've gone before us, you've changed circumstances, And sometimes we think it's because we did something wonderful or special. Thank you, Lord, that you're before us and you're behind us and you're to the side and that uh, we even have those wonderful angels who are ministering spirits who have been sent forth for those who are heirs of salvation. Thank you that you protect us. Bless your word to us now. Might we grow, might our faith increase, and might we leave this place excited, different, for the cause of Christ and with the desire to enhance heaven. It's really what it's all about. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated, folks. My desire, I've been thinking about this lately. I've talked to several people, and I know we all hope that God is taking into account our plan, and we're hoping that our plan is his plan. But I want to encourage you to think on it this way. That might be a little backwards. It might be good to realize that God's plan should be our plan. And if he changes our plan or changes our desires, that would be a good thing. Everywhere you go, whether it's school Whether it's work, and I understand these things are changing, uh, things are not what they used to be, but most places where you go, there is a code of ethics. There are rules. When I was a dean of students at Bible College, we had something called the standard. And it was a very thick book that was filled with rules. And when I came, part of my job, seems it's my job everywhere I go, was to kind of condense it and bring it down because it was just so weighty and the students were never going to read it anyway. So it was important for them to know the gist of things. But there was a code of ethics, how to talk, how not to talk, how to dress, um, where to go, where not to go, dress codes. Most places that are conservative in any way at all have a code of ethics. And I think that's an important thing. Um, I remember years ago when I went up to New York State, uh, you wouldn't think I'd give you an illustration of a supermarket, but I found a supermarket that was incredible. Uh, When I went up there, our dear friend said, you have to go to Wegman. Now, Wegmans, if you've traveled around the continental United States, you'll find them in New Jersey, you'll find them in New York, they're in some other places. Um, My friend said, Wegmans is an experience. And we found that to be true. We were like, how can a supermarket be an experience? We would actually go there to eat like we were going to a fine restaurant. We would sit up top in a balcony, and I would watch the workings of Wegmans because I thought, they are so synchronized, they are so coordinated, this will work anywhere. This will work in church, this will work in a company. Every department you saw below, they had a different color outfit. 
If you were simply making a rotisserie chicken, you had a chef's hat on. I mean, they looked so sharp and so professional. You just wanted to eat there. You just wanted to buy something. And I think it was incredible that they were so sharp and so polished. Why is it that as believers, we are so sloppy sometimes? And we feel like we don't have to be sharp. We don't have to do things the right way. Now, I understand when we're not there yet and we're trying to do certain things, but we ought to be steering ourselves in a way that would bring a smile to the face of God. Um, We ought to be concerned about things. You know, um, I might have an English major sitting out in the congregation, and if our PowerPoint isn't spelled correctly, that doesn't look real good. So we want to try to fix those things and do things that are right so that we shine for the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that churches are kind of like restaurants? I was talking to somebody about that the other day. You have your smorgasbord. You go somewhere that makes everything and it all tastes the same. You know, you get lasagna and it tastes like the morning eggs. You know, and you come to church and Some churches will give you a little of everything. You know, there's no absolutes, there's no real clear, definite doctrine, but whatever you're looking for, you might find that thing here. Maybe you're seeking entertainment. You're not really into the preaching or the teaching, but boy, you sure do desire a good band. And if I can find a good band, that will be my church. I don't care what they teach. Maybe you're looking for a little motivation. Just motivate me. I just want to feel good about myself. Don't tell me the things that are going to bring me down. Tell me the things that are going to always lift me up. In fact, I'll even write out what you should say. And we find that churches are kind of like that many times. And the churches that are giving forth the word of God, hopefully with love, hopefully it's fun, hopefully you're doing some things that can incorporate people into what you're doing, but we have to parallel, we get to parallel scripture, the word of God. We cannot deviate from that. Now, I'm not saying that we should be boring. God is not a boring God. We are boring sometimes, but God is never boring. Boring. I used to have a slogan when I did teenagers years ago. It is a sin to bore a teenager. (laughs) You should not. I mean, I directed youth camps, hundreds and thousands of kids for years. God is not boring. But sometimes we are. And we need to get on board with what God is doing. This morning we're continuing our series on Christian wear. How do you dress as a believer? What Christian outfit do you put on in the morning? How do you prepare yourself for your day, for your life, for your family, for your job, as you put on Christian graces, which is the title? Putting on and putting off is the issue. Now, you will find Christian graces are found throughout the Word of God. We're in Colossians 3, but you'll also find it in 2 Peter, the first chapter, You'll find it in the Beatitudes. You'll find it in the fruits of the Spirit. Throughout the Word of God, God is pleading with us to act right, to do things with decency and order, to do things like Jesus would. I mentioned this Wednesday night when I was in Bible college uh, doing the dean of students thing. I had a group of students who came to school. There were about eight of them, and they were like the Green Beret. They were from Victory Baptist Church in Rochester, New York, and they thought they were all that. And they loved to mimic their pastor. He was their hero. And that happens many times. Kids come to Bible college, and if you don't do it like their home church, you're wrong. You know, it can't be different. And they'd be on the phone calling their pastor saying, you don't know what's going on down here. You know, and they're doing it this way. And the pastor would say, just comply. Just submit yourself to it. It's not that big a deal. 
But the pastor had a way about him that if he said something in the wrong way, with the wrong attitude, with the wrong spirit, he would say with kind of an effeminate voice, oh, that's so Christian. Well, these six students would do the same thing at the Bible college, and I really got sick of it. If anybody didn't talk right or act right or their tone was wrong, you'd hear it down the hallway. Oh, that's so Christian. And they loved to say that. And what they were basically saying was, you're not acting right. You're not acting or conducting yourself like a Christian, like a believer. You should talk differently. You should do differently. And even though many times they were right, we didn't want to hear it from them. We really didn't. And uh, they would do that demonstrating what goes on. Have you ever found yourself not acting like a Christian? Not here. I'm sure this is just preventative maintenance. You know, but uh, you think the wrong thing. Your attitude is wrong. You get upset. You get spiteful. You get jealous. You compare yourself with others. You're not content. Have I hit anybody yet? You know, all of those uh, things sometimes. How about enablement? How about blame? How about that should be me? Why is that happening to them? You know, we go through that stuff and the Holy Spirit tells us we're not acting right. Gandhi made the statement that he would have become a Christian if it was not for Christians. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that an encouragement? This guy might have become a Christian if I had acted differently, if I had spoken differently. Folks, we have a world that is in need, and many times our Christian graces are messed up. Now, I'm not going to get too specific because the person I'm going to tell you about could show up at some point at our church, but this week I had a broken-hearted man who came to see me, and it was uh, we had some stuff going on, some interaction between us, and his life has fallen apart. I barely know the guy. The guy walked into my home. I had taken the afternoon off so I could meet him about some business. He was making us something. And uh, he walked into the home and started telling me about his tragedies, which I will not um, elaborate upon. Suddenly he burst into tears, and he's in my arms. Grown man, owns a business, and I'm hugging him, and I'm praying with him, and I'm thinking, this is what it's all about. People are hurting. You know, I joke with people Wednesday night when I say, how are you? And I always am skeptical of the people who say, good, good. Tell me you do it. It's always two goods. Good, good. You know, and it's like, I know you're not good when you do good, good. You know, now some of you will joke with me about this. I know that. You know, I'll get texts and things like that. But um, how are you really? People are falling apart. Their jobs, they're losing them. The economy's tougher than you think. They're having relational issues. They're brokenhearted. They're lonely. They've lost a life partner. They're sick or they have some kind of a disease that they'll never get rid of. They need Jesus. And we need to show forth Christian graces so that they can have hope. Colossians is an epistle. An epistle is simply a letter from God. I read something probably about five years ago that was entitled, Royal Mail in a Postman's Bag. And the author said, have you ever received a letter from a dear friend or a family member in which love was expressed, but along with the love, there was some carefully placed criticism. Call it tough love. A letter of commendation mixed with some painfully frank suggestion for improvement. What if you were engaged and a letter like that came from your fiancé or your husband or your wife or your best friend sent you a letter like that, would you be angry? Would you be bitter? Would you be repentant or would you be accepting? Because that letter would have some weight because you love them. Well, the bridegroom of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, sent us 
this letter called Colossians, telling us how to act, telling us how to demonstrate Christian grace. I'm a Christian, and I need to act like it now. Read the book of James. It'll tell you how to behave as a Christian. God accepts you the way you are and the way I am, but he refuses to leave you there. Don't you feel that way if you love your kids? If you love your grandkids? I love you the way you are. You're doing some dumb stuff. But I refuse to leave you there because I love you. So I want to look at a couple of things, very simple things that sometimes we neglect in the busyness of life that will help us as we try to be like Jesus and show forth the Christian graces. Number one, Colossians 3 and verse 12 Tender mercies. Doesn't that even sound nice? Tender mercies. Don't we need some people to be tender with us? Don't you get ridicule and accusations in the world, and people are combative, and people have pugnacious, where did that word come from? Uh, pugnacious attitudes, and they come attacking, right? We get enough of that. We need tender mercies. We need people to be loving and kind. Verse 12 says, Therefore, as the elect, you could replace elect with chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. So it sounds like it's our responsibility. Well, Lord, if you want me to be tender, you're just going to have to make me tender. If you want me to be tender, you're going to have to uh, make me tender and help me to show mercy. But the Bible says we, as the elect of God, are to put on tender mercies because people are hurting. Let your tenderest feelings come in contact with the misery of the distressed. Anybody distressed here today? Does anyone know someone who's distressed? They're broken. They're heartbroken. They're not enjoying life. They're not sure how to live. They live from one moment to the next. They know how to smile. They know how to put on, you know, uh, a pleasant demeanor. But they're brokenhearted, and they're dying on the inside. Could we possibly have the discernment to stop and take our focus off ourselves, and to look around and see who's hurting and to reach out to them and say, Lord, I need some divine appointments. Send some people that you have divinely directed towards me. Lord, with all my heart, I want to talk to some people today. I want to meet up with some people who are in need. I want to reach them. Could we possibly pray that? Would there be anything wrong with that? I don't think so. Uh, in the book of Philemon, verse 21, I'm just going to tell you the story very quickly, but Paul was in prison. Philemon is a prison letter, a prison epistle. And Paul gets to know this Onesimus, who was a runaway slave. And Onesimus ends up receiving Christ as Savior, and Onesimus ends up being a great blessing to the Apostle Paul, but Paul wants to do right. And he wants to send Onesimus back to Philemon because Philemon is his boss, and it's the right thing to do. But Paul says to Philemon, remember, he's a fellow believer now, and I'm sure whatever I'm asking you to do for Onesimus, you'll do much more than I've even asked. Wouldn't it be great if someone asked us to do something in the Christian realm and we said, can I do more? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Can I take an extra couple of steps? Can I get involved in having some of my own initiative? Can I think outside the box? Can I think of what would really be a blessing and incorporate my own personality into it? Wouldn't that be wonderful? The other thing on Wednesday night, we've been studying Joseph. And Joseph wants his brothers come to Egypt, and Joseph is the number two guy in all of Egypt. 
Joseph demands that his younger brother Benjamin be brought to Egypt. And when Joseph sees Benjamin, he has to leave the room because he bursts into tears because of the heartache that Joseph had gone through. But the thing that's so amazing about Joseph, when he meets up with his brothers who threw him in a hole, sold him into slavery, ends up in Potiphar's house, is convicted of rape, goes to jail, interprets some dreams of the baker and the butler. Joseph says, remember me. They forget him for two years. While he's in jail, he's still just a young man. He's gone through all this. He could have been so bitter, all he wants to do is wipe his brothers from the face of the earth. And yet when they bow down before him, he looks at them and he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good so that I could save much life. He said, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to nourish you. I'm going to love your kids and your grandkids. I'm going to do right by you. I am going to have the right godly graces to show you what the God of heaven is all about. Tender mercy. Does Christian love and mercy really work? Do you get people's attention when you're sweet and you're loving and you don't give them what you think they deserve? Even in moments of tension and difficulty, tender mercy. Secondly, kindness. Kindness. Again, I'm just going to keep reading the same verse. Verse 12, therefore is the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Hey, what's the difference between compassion and kindness? Compassion is feelings of deep sympathy and sorrow for an individual who's experiencing suffering and heartache with a strong desire to alleviate the pain, but most of the time you don't do anything. Somebody ought to help that guy. Somebody ought to feed her. Somebody ought to give some guidance to that young teenage woman. Somebody should do something. I feel so bad for her compassion. But kindness is all action. Taking care of needs. James 1.22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. I'm not only going to feel bad for you, I'm going to be kind and do something about it. And I'm going to stand in the gap and I am going to help you out. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan? The priests, the Levite, when they saw this guy who had been beaten up laying by the side of the road, they crossed over to the other side of the street, didn't they? As he was making his way to Jericho, he was beaten up. I'm sure they thought to themselves, that's a shame. Somebody should do something. I can't believe he's in that state. Wow, wish I had the time and they walked by on the other side. Now, the Samaritan, and we assume the guy beaten up was a Jew, comes along, bends down, wraps his wounds, takes care of him, brings him to an inn, tells them to take care of him. He says, when I come back, if you've incurred any more costs, I'll pay you. And Samaritans didn't get along with the Jews. They had strong animosity between them. But he showed kindness. He did what he could do. And the religious crowd, they felt bad. It's not hard to feel bad. It's much more difficult to do something. Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Can we ever forget that we've been forgiven? Can we ever forget that the sinless Son of God had nails driven through his hands and feet because of our sin? I don't even know what went on spiritually 
in the spiritual realm as he was taunted on that cross. I don't know what went on, but I thank God for his love. The third thing this morning, and we're just kind of moving quickly through them, humility and meekness. Colossians 3 and verse 12, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility. I can't make myself humble. I can't wake up in the morning and say, this is going to be a humble day. (laughs) I am going to be the most humble pastor I've ever been. Just watch me. (laughs) Sounds kind of prideful. I had somebody say to me years ago, I wanted to grab him by the throat. They said, you know, once you know you're humble, you're not humble anymore. (laughs) I said, well, thank you. God bless you. Go on your way. And kind of kind of sent them off. Humility, meekness. Moses was the meekest man to ever walk the face of the earth. And I think you remember some of this. While they wandered in the wilderness, Numbers 12 and verse 3, there was some wild stuff going on in the wilderness. You realize that, don't you? There were shoes that wouldn't wear out. There was manna that was on the ground every day to feed them. There was God's presence, you know, a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. Their shoes, you know, didn't wear out. It was kind of crazy, these things going on. And there was this big rock. And this rock is hopping along, following them. And God tells Moses, strike the rock one time and water will come forth from it. So Moses strikes the rock, and water comes from the rock. A little bit later on, we find that they need water again, and God says, this time, speak to the rock. Just talk to it, and you'll receive water. But the people are complaining, and they're negative, and they're they're missing Egypt. They're like, oh, the locks and the bagels and the flesh pots. I can't believe we're eating this junk. Manna, 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 manna. 19,000 ways to prepare manna. I'm sick of it. Right? So they're complaining. So Moses looks at him and he goes, You want water? Whack! Whack! And he strikes the rock twice. Now you might say, What's the big deal? He lost his cool. He was the humblest man to ever walk the face of the earth. Look at everything he went through. Well, you've got to remember 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 4 says that rock was Christ. That was representative of Christ. And when that rock was struck once, that's where the law met up with grace. And it was a picture of the crucifixion. So when that rock was struck twice suddenly, when all you need to do now is talk to God through Christ, because the crucifixion is already taking place. We are not to crucify the Lord afresh. Amen? Over and over and over again. It wasn't that Moses lost its cool. God knows we're human. But it was the nature of what the rock represented. And that kept Moses and Aaron out of the promised land. That's how serious a thing it was. The humility that they were to have, the meekness that they were to have. Remember that meekness is not weakness. Remember Jesus was described as gentle and meek, which I think are qualities of strength. I think we need men to be meek, and we need men to be gentle. I really believe that, because that's the way our Savior was. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. James 4, verses 6 and 7. I talked to you about Joseph a few moments ago. Joseph interprets the dream of the baker. Remember what happened to the baker? He lost his what? His head, right? His head was cut off. The butler, what happened to him? He was restored to Pharaoh, right? 
And then the butler remembers Joseph when Pharaoh starts having some bad dreams about the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine. And Pharaoh calls for Joseph. They had to clean Joseph up first. Because you don't stand before Pharaoh all grungy looking. They put fine linen on him. They gave him a bath. And he stands before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, I hear that you can interpret dreams. Now, how are most young men? Young men struggle more than young women with with being proud. Can you interpret my dreams, Pharaoh said. Now, most young men would say, hey, Pharaoh, I got this. Did you hear what I did with the baker? Did you hear what I did with the butler? Did it come to pass? Joseph doesn't say that. He said, I cannot give you the answer you're looking for. Boy, they could have lopped off his head. He had to talk again really quick. But I have a God who can tell you the interpretation of the dream. A young man with humility who is going to receive all the riches of Egypt, and yet he's humble, he's meek, and he is the mouthpiece of Almighty God. We don't have to make things happen. God will make things happen for us. And thank God for his humility. The fourth thing, I hate this word, long-suffering. Long-suffering and bearing with one another. Colossians 3, the end of verse 12, it says, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another... Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. I thank God nobody's ever had a complaint about me. (laughs) Not. I've had plenty of people that have complaints about me. I don't always understand it. I have done some stupid things in my life, but sometimes people just have complaints. Do we still love them? Do we still pray for them? Do we still care how things work out in their life. Christian grace is long-suffering. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Long-suffering is a fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to cultivate that in us. Who are you persevering with right now? Maybe they're sitting next to you. (laughs) Who are you persevering with, you know? Who is a, if we were cowboys and cowgirls, who is a burr in your saddle? Right? I'm not from that part of the country, but I know what it means. Right? Who's a pain in the neck in your life? Who tests you day in and day out, 24-7? They're driving you nuts. Maybe it's a short drive. Maybe not. God wants us to be long-suffering. Isn't he that way? Doesn't he put up with us? I mean, I know even pastoring the times I want to rip out the hair that I no longer have. You know, and I'm like, come on, what part of this don't you see? Thank God he is long-suffering. I remember when my kids didn't act right in the back of the car. Maybe you never did this, but I did. I wanted to get them. And I'd be driving along, and I'd start swinging at them. I'd be like this with this one. And they're back there. You know, and uh, I won't be playing racquetball if I keep that up. (laughs) You know, I mean, I just wanted to smack them. They were driving me nuts. I had three in the back seat one time, and they're screaming. This was, Remember the first little Hondas that came out, the Civics? It looked like a sneaker. They're screaming back there, He's touching me! I'm like, you have two and a half feet back there. What do you mean he's touching me? He's touching me! You know, and I start swinging at him. I couldn't take it anymore. I'm on a long trip. I'm sweating. I have no air conditioning. I'm hungry. And he's touching me. Driving me nuts. You know? I probably did not persevere 
as long as I should have with them, but they love to tell those stories, so apparently it gave them some pleasure. Who are you persevering with? Is it a coworker? Is it a family member? Is it somebody who's done you wrong, or they've cheated you, or they haven't been fair to you? Have you suffered some injustice? The world is full of it, right? Finally, forgiving one another, Colossians 3 and verse 13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. And I've already quoted Ephesians 4.32, being kind one to another. Joseph, Genesis 50, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. Here's what I'm going to do, not on your merit, not because of what you did to me, but because of who God is. I see people sometimes who are unwilling to forgive. And they'll say to me, Pastor, I've forgiven her. I don't talk to her anymore. But I've forgiven her. If I see her in the frozen food section at the supermarket, I very quickly rush to the cereal aisle. But I've forgiven her. I just don't deal with her. I've forgiven her on the inside. Well, what happened to Joseph saying, I will nourish your little ones. I love you. I won't take this out on you. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. I am going to exercise godly graces in your direction because it might change you. That's when people sit up and take notice. Well, I'll treat them right if they treat me right. That ain't going to win anybody to Christ. Nobody at all. Nice people in the world can do that. So we need to be forgiving people. Remember the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18? He owed millions of dollars and he couldn't repay it. And his master forgave him the debt. Then he went after somebody else and grabbed them by the throat because they owed him like a hundred bucks. We're like that sometimes because God has forgiven us beyond what we could repay. And we have to realize that as we reach out to the Lord. The final thing today, above all, put on love. There's a lot of different kinds of love in the Bible. Colossians 3.14 says, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Now, this is an interesting point. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, talks about the gifts of the Spirit. Part of the gifts of the Spirit are the sign gifts. Speaking in tongues, slaying people in the Spirit, healing. People love that stuff. They love it. But when you get to the end of the chapter, 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says to the church at Corinth, who had their problems, yet I'm going to show you a better way. And what's the better way? 1 Corinthians 13. Have you ever read 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter? Right? Tells you what love is, and the love is agape love, which is unconditional love. God doesn't wait until you're lovely until he loves you. Some of us would never be loved if that was the stipulation. I am going to love you regardless of who you are, where you've been, what you've done, and how you've wronged me. I am going to love you because that will reach you for the Lord but I ignore them. I don't get in their way. Isn't that enough? No, you're like the Levite and the priest crossing the street. That's not kindness. We need to be kind and ask God for opportunity. Some of the loves in the Bible, eros in the Greek. We get our word erotic from that. That's not love, and you know that. Sturgo, meaning familiar, the natural bond between a mother and her child. That's why we are so vehemently against abortion, because there should be a bond there with that child that is within mom's womb, a natural affection that God gives that person. Phileo, 
Brotherly love. You've all heard of the city of brotherly love. Philadelphia. And agape. Unconditional. What does God say? Put it on. But I don't feel like it. Love is not a feeling, it's an action. Amen? Love, I used to hear this guy, used to drive me crazy. He sang this little jingle all the time. Love is something you do, love is something you do. Not always something you can feel, but it's real. Love is something you do, love is something you do, because Jesus Christ is living in you. You just do it because of Jesus. And you've been forgiven. And you have been spared judgment because of his love. The result, look at Colossians 3 and verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. When you do all this stuff, you start to feel peace. You start to feel better about yourself. You start to feel like you're more like Jesus. And then it goes on to say, and be thankful. Thanksgiving is therapeutic, right? Well, when you start thanking God, you won't be complaining in the next breath. If you're thanking God for who he is. Folks, how are your Christian graces? Are we sloppy in that area? I do my best at work. I'm sharp. I'm slick. I do everything according, you know, to the things I've learned. I'm productive. How are you as a Christian? How are you as a believer? Could my boys from Victory Baptist Church look at you and say, Ow, oh, that's so Christian. Are we bringing a smile to God's face? Are we becoming more and more like the Savior? That's part of the sanctification process in this life. It's already begun. God is preparing you because you are going to be presented to God one day without spot and without blemish. And the process goes on even now as I speak. Let's bow for a word of prayer together. Heads bowed and eyes closed. How are you doing with your Christian graces? Are you becoming more like the Savior? Do you look from time to time and say, wow, it's a miracle, God is changing me. I don't think like I used to. I would have been agitated, I would have been prideful, but God is causing me to think differently and to lead with my heart. Maybe you just want to thank him for a moment by an uplifted hand. I do see some change, Pastor, and I praise God for it. Keep me in prayer today. I want to stay on that path. Anybody like that today? Thank you, dear lady. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, brother. Amen. I want to stay on that path. I want to be like my Savior. It's not always easy. It's not always convenient. But we want to be more than compassionate. We want to be kind. We want to do something about the needs of people. Pastor, I'm going through some stuff right now, and I know that I need a B12 shot in the area of Christian graces. Pray for me. Thank you, dear lady. Thank you, brother. Thank you, dear lady. I need God to do something that I cannot do for myself. I see your hand. Amen. Somebody else, I see your hand. I see your hand, dear lady. Anybody else? Pray for me. Father, we thank you that we could be here today. We thank you for your goodness, and we thank you, Lord, that you are the one changing us. We are your workmanship, created for good works in Christ Jesus. Forgive us when we think that we can pull this off on our own. We have to trust in your grace, and we need to yield and submit to you, and we need to determine that we're going to put on and put off but we need your power. We need your enablement. We need your advice and your direction and your continued example as we look into your word. Help us, Lord, not to just be religious and in the right place at the right time most of the time. Help us to be more like you. 
Help us to realize it's the only way we will reach the hurting. And Lord, many of us were hurting and we came to Christ and it's made the difference. It hasn't taken all the problems away, but we have a Savior to lean on and to trust and to talk to daily. Thank you. We ask it in Christ's name.